This is the chapter review of chapter one. Um, make sure you know your definitions. There will be definitions on the test. Now some of these are somewhat open-ended definitions, so it's hard to make an exact definition for it. You'll have to be able to illustrate it and do the best job you can. A point we would call an exact location in space, okay? To illustrate a point, we would just put a point and put a variable, capital variable. But the definition would be an exact location in space. A line is made up of points extending in opposite directions forever and ever. So that would be your definition of it. Your illustration might look something like this. You're going to put two points there. You'll name the points, and you're going to call this line AB or line BA. Collinear would be points that are on the same line. For instance, A and B up here are collinear. Um, a plane would be a flat surface made up of points. So that would be a definition of it. An example of it, you might draw something that looks like this. Make sure you put three points on it that are non-collinear. And that would represent a plane. I could, and then maybe I've got a cursive H down here. And I could call this plane H. I could call this plane a, B, C, plane B, C, A, plane, in any order of those letters you want to put it in, C, A, B, um, and continuing, but any, those three letters in any order you want to do it. Coplanar, the definition would be lies on the same plane. So you're going to make sure that you know those definitions and be able to apply those definitions in problems if you read that word in a problem. So in other words, if you read that something was collinear in a problem, you would know that those points lie on the same line. Um, section 2 had to do with precision of measurements. And we were asking for the precisions of something that might measure from 56.4, we go, what is the precision of that? You would take the next spot over, so and then you would take half of that spot. So 0 0.05, so I'm adding and subtracting 0 0.05 to that original number. So I have 56.35 to 56 point four five so the number 56.4 is the precise number of numbers ranging from 56.35 to 56.45 on this one I have point zero 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 five one two three spots the next spot half of that spot is 5 so I'm going to add or subtract so when I subtract I get 1.4515 when I add I get 1.4525 so that would be the precision of that number now when you have fractions you do it a little bit different what you're going to do is you're going to take the bottom number of the fraction you're going to multiply it by 2 so I'm going to add or subtract here 1 tenth, okay, because 5 times 2 is 10. So I am going to take this number, which is actually 8 tenths, if I gave it a common denominator of 10. And so when I subtract 1, I get 7 tenths. When I add 1, I get 9 tenths. So that is the precision of 4 fifths. This one, I would add or subtract 1 6 2. So I'm taking the 3, I'm multiplying it by 2. This is the same as 4 6. So when I subtract, I get a 3 6. When I add, 
I get a 5 6, but don't forget any fraction you see that can be reduced should be, so I'm going to change this to 1 half to 5 6. So make sure you can find the precision of a measurement. And then you have to use the concept of betweenness to solve a problem. Between just literally means somewhere between two points. So an example of the problem might be that you find the value of the variable, okay, so the x or the q or the w, and then it tells you that, and, and you're trying to find the variable plus pb, if p is between a and b. Well, I don't know where it falls, but I'm going to go ahead and draw my illustration so I can understand by looking at it what's going on. There's the line AB. I'm going to put P somewhere between those. Then it tells me AP is 7. It tells me PB is 3X. And it tells me AB is 25. Well, you can see that if I add the 7 plus the 3X, I should get the total measurement of 25. So that becomes my illustration that turns into an equation. So I have this. I'm just simply going to use algebra to solve it. So I'm going to subtract 7 from both sides. That's going to give me 3x is equal to 18. When I divide by 3, I'm going to get x is equal to 6. So there's my variable. But then I've got to plug back in to find PB. So 3 times 6 is going to give me 18, because that's the equation for PB. So those are the two things that I'm looking for. Um, another, it's still using the same figure here. So if I go ahead and redraw my figure, and I've got A, and I've got B, and somewhere in the middle I've got a P. It tells me AP is S plus 2, PB is 4S, and then it tells me AB is 8S minus 7. Again, the two parts added together gives me the whole. So I have S plus 2 plus 4s is equal to 8s minus 7. So combining like terms, I get a 5s plus 2 equals 8s minus 7. I'm going to subtract the 2. So I get a 5s equals 8s minus 9. I'm going to subtract the 8s. So I get a negative 3s equals negative 9. I'm going to come over here. Uh, negative 3s equals negative 9. I'm going to divide by negative 3. And I'm going to get s is equal to 3. Well, that's part of what I was trying to find. But then I've got to plug back in for my PB, which is 4 times S. So I go 4 times 3. That's going to give me a 12. So that's the other part that I was trying to find. Definition of congruency means it has the same size. So you have to look at segments and tell whether they're congruent or not and write your congruency statement. Um, on these two triangles, you can see that BC here would be congruent to EF. So B, C, and it's a line segment. The congruency mark is an equal sign with a twiddle above it. So B, C is congruent to E, F. And that would be how I would write that. Um, sometimes they'll just show you that. So if they both have a one line on it, you know that they are congruent. So they might give you that rather than giving you the actual measurement. All right, distance and midpoint. Um, you need to know your formulas for distance on a number line and distance on a coordinate plane. So um, let's do number line here. 
On a number line, it is the absolute value of one spot on the number line minus the other spot. So if you're trying to find the distance between A and B, you could go A minus B and then take the absolute value of it, or you can go B minus A and take the absolute value of it. If you are on a coordinate plane, you are going to use the distance formula, which is the square root of the difference between the x's, x sub 2 minus x sub 1 squared, plus the difference in the y's, x, y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared. The midpoint formula on the number line, you're going to take the two numbers that you're trying to find the middle point between, you're going to add them together, and you're going to divide by 2. With the midpoint, you're basically just finding the average. Um, on the coordinate plane, the midpoint x, you're going to go x sub 1 plus x sub 2 divided by 2. So you're going to add the two x values together and divide it by 2. The midpoint y is the exact same thing. You're going to go y sub 1 plus y sub 2 divided by 2. Okay, so make sure you know those formulas, and then you're going to have to be able to use those formulas. So if I'm trying to find the distance between these two points, they, of course, are on a coordinate plane. So I'm going to take the square root of 4 minus 3. Actually, I did my y's first, but it doesn't matter. You can do your x first or your y's first. It doesn't matter. Negative 7 minus 3 squared. And I'm going to get 1 squared, which is 1. And I'm going to get a negative 10 squared, because I'm going to add the opposite there, which is going to be 100. So the distance between those two points would be the square root of 101, which is approximately 10.0. So that would be the distance between those two points on a coordinate plane. If I was going to try and find my midpoint between these, so I'm looking for the point, the ordered pair, that's exactly in the middle between those two. So the midpoint x is equal to negative 6 plus 12 divided by 2. So that's going to give me 6 over 2 or 3. So the midpoint x, or the point exactly in the middle, is 3. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the y. Midpoint y is equal to negative 3, I'm going to add my y's together, plus negative 7 divided by 2. So that's going to give me a negative 10 divided by 2, or a negative 5. So the point that's exactly in the middle between this point and this point would be a 3, negative 5. Section 1-4, you need to be able to measure an angle using a protractor, be able to name it, and be able to classify it, whether it's a right, which means it's exactly equal to 90 degrees, an acute, which means it's less than 90 degrees, or obtuse, which means it's greater than 90 degrees. So I'm going to line up my uh, center point on my vertex. I'm going to use the outside numbers because that's when I take my line and extend it, the zeros on the top there, then I'm going to come back over here and it's going to be approximately 140 degrees. Okay. Now, if I want to name, so obviously this is an obtuse angle because it's greater than 90 degrees, so there's the angle symbol. I could name this angle A, B, C, angle C, B, A, or in this particular circumstances, I could name it angle B. 
Um, they might even give me a number there that I could name it by that number. But remember, you cannot start with the vertex. Okay, the angle is formed by two rays that have a common endpoint. That endpoint is what we call the vertex. An angle bisector cuts an angle exactly in half, and so we'll have to be able to use that in problems, use that concept in, in problems. Um, in this one, and these are all rays, okay, it says CB and CD are opposite rays, which means they form a straight line. CE bisects D. C, F. Now that means that cuts that exactly in half, so that angle and that angle would be congruent. Then it also says that C, G bisects angle F, C, B. So that angle and that angle would be considered congruent. Okay, notice these two have one mark, which means they match up. Those two have two marks, which means they match up. So in this particular one, I'm going to use this information to solve this problem. It says DCE, which is this, has this measurement. So that's that measurement. ECF has this measurement. These two are congruent, which means I need to set them equal to each other. And then solve. And it's asked me to find this particular angle, so I'll have to plug it back in. So I have a negative 2x by subtracting my 6x. I'm subtracting my 15, which gives me a negative 20. And when I divide, I get a positive 10. So then I plug it back into this formula. So I have 4 times 10 plus 15. So I have 40 plus 15, or I have a 55, OK? So that's going to be the measure of angle DCE. Okay, same illustration. Down here, they give me the measurement of this angle, which is this. They give them, me the measurement of this angle, which is this. Again, they're congruent angles, so I set them equal to each other and solve. Subtracting the 13x, I get a negative 4x. Subtracting the 3, I get a negative 12. When I solve by dividing by negative 4, I get a 3. But I have to plug it back in because I'm trying to find C GCB. So 13 times 3 minus 9. So this is going to give me a 39 minus 9, which is going to give me a 30. So that is the measure of that angle. Section 1.5 is about angle relationships. You need to be able to define these and recognize the following terms. So if I have an adjacent angle, it's two angles that lie on the same plane that share a common endpoint. So here's an angle. They share a common endpoint and a common side. So there are angles that are right next to each other, but notice they don't have any interior points in common. So angle A, B, C would be adjacent to angle C, B, D. They have a common endpoint and a common side. Vertical angles are two non-adjacent angles. They're not right next to each other, but they're formed by intersecting lines. So if I l number these angles, I can say angle 1 and angle 3 are vertical lines. They're right across from each other. They share a common endpoint, but no common sides, and they're formed by intersecting lines. Angle 2 and angle 4 are also uh, um, vertical angles, so they're right across from each other. A linear pair is a pair of adjacent angles whose non-common side are opposite rays. So in other words, they form a straight line when put together. Okay, they have to be right next to each other, and they have their here's the side they have in common, but their non-common side forms a straight line. 
So angle one and angle two is a linear pair. Complementary angles are two angles whose measure have the sum of 90. Notice it doesn't say that they have to be adjacent. They can be adjacent. So angle one and angle two are equal to 90 degrees. They are complementary angles. Or I might have A, B, C, and that might be 30 degrees. And then let's say I've got this angle, which is X, Y, Z, and that's 50 degrees. Well, obviously when you add the, oops, should be 60 degrees. When you add these two angles together, they equal 90. So angle A, B, C is a complementary angle to angle X, Y, Z. Now supplementary is the same, except for they add up to 180. And again, they can be adjacent So 1 and 2 would be supplementary angles because they add up to 180 degrees. Or they can be non-adjacent. If these are both equal to 90, Then these two, angle A, B, C, and angle D, E, F, would be supplementary angles because together, when you add them, they equal 180. So again, these two do not have to be adjacent. All right, perpendicular lines are lines that form a right angle when they cross. So they intersect and they form a right angle. Actually, if you will, they form four right angles. Um, so we have to use the above definitions to solve given problems. For instance, if I looked at this illustration and I said name a pair of adjacent angles, I could say angle 4 and angle 5. Any two angles that are right next to each other are adjacent angles. A linear pair would form a straight line. Okay, this angle and this angle, so angle 1. And angle, I have to use letters for this, R, Q, P would be a linear pair. Vertical angles be formed by intersecting lines. The lines have to intersect. It would be angle 1 and angle 5. Using this information of problem, um, let's say... I need to find the measure of angle F, G, E if I have this as my formula. Now notice I've got a 90 degree mark there and I'm finding that so that FC is perpendicular to AE. So I know that that's got to equal 90 degrees. So 5X plus 10 equals 90. I'm going to subtract the 10, so I have 5x is equal to 80. When I divide, I'm going to get a 16. Now, that's all they were asking me for was the x. Same illustration, I have b, g, c, and I have c, g, d. So I have the measurement of this. This is 16x minus 4. This is 2x plus 13. And it says find x so that B, G, D is a right angle. Well, I know a right angle is 90 degrees. So I can go 16x minus 4 plus 2x plus 13 equals 90. Combine like terms. So I have 18x and I have 9 equals 90. I'm going to subtract the 9, so I have 18x is equal to 81. When I divide, I should get, um, let's see, 81, I'm going to get 4.5. And that's all I was looking at was how to find the x, okay? 
Section 1-6 is polygons. Uh, you need to be able to name a polygon based on the number of its sides. There's a chart on page 46 that has them all listed out for you. And you've got to be able to tell whether it is concave. When you extend the lines, does it uh, cross over on itself? Or is it convex? And if it's convex, is it regular? All the sides have the same measurement and all the angles have the same measurement. Or is it irregular that the sides and angles have different measurements? Uh, you've got to be able to use that information about the polygon to be able to solve perimeter problems both on the coordinate plane and not on the coordinate plane. Obviously, if it's on the coordinate plane, you're going to be using the distance formula. If it's not, it might look something like this. Find the length of each of these sides um, for the polygon, and I'll go ahead and put letters here so we can distinguish the sides. Um, if it has this given perimeter. So remember, the perimeter means the distance all the way around it. Now, if you see, this has congruency marks on it. So if this is 6n minus 8, this one is 6n minus 8. If this one is n, this one is n. Now, when I add these all together, it should give me 26. So I, can t I could do it this way, where I have two sides that are 6n minus 8, and then I have two other sides that are just n. And when I add that, I should get 26. So I'm going to do distributed property on this. Or you could list them all out individually and just add it. So I have 12n minus 16 plus 2n equals 26. So I have 14n minus 16 equals 26. I'm going to add the 16 to both sides. So I have 14n is equal to 42. And then I'm going to divide by the 14. And that should give me 3, I believe. Let me double check that. But yeah, comes out even at 3. So, but remember, it asks for the length of each side. So AB and DC, I've got to plug back into this. So this would be 18 minus 8. I put the 3 in for the N. So 18 minus 8 is 10. So both of those sides are 10. And of course, the BC and the AD are both equal to 3 because they're equal to N. All right, your homework on this, review homework, is page 53 through 56, 8 through 46 even.